So, hello everyone and welcome to day four. And um, today what we are gonna be talking about is, um, <clears throat> we are gonna be talking about, I hope everybody remembers what's the topic for today. YB, do you remember? <clears throat> Yeah. So today our topic is dark matter with gravitational lensing. So we're going to show you using data, HST data, how could you actually assess the amount of dark matter in a galaxy? Yeah, thanks, Vaibhi. Yeah. So uh, Mamta, uh, I think she wants to give you all some announcements. Mamta, you want to say something? Oh, <laughs> I can always say something, sure. <laughs> no problem. I think the 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 training program third is going very well today we have again a very interesting topic and uh, priya and Najam, they have done an excellent job until now and i'm sure with this regular training programs people are getting very uh, in a's with uh, using uh, top cat especially i'm sure they're getting experts and they start to understand how to uh, play with different catalogs and how to correlate the data so that's really good and it's about today we are not using top cat Today, today we are on a level. Top cat. No, <laughs> today <laughs> not. But yeah. otherwise, yeah, it's my favorite tool. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so that's great. So today we are going to talk about dark matter and gravitational lensing. That's a very interesting topic. It's a bit. Uh, uh, I think people find at, at graduate level, people find it a little bit challenging to understand this whole concept. So we are very lucky today that uh, Naja Hassan is going to give us some introduction on this topic before we really get into the tutorial part, which will be handled by Priya. So besides this, please remember to uh, do your, uh, uh, your, your assignments and uh, send us your assignments and send us uh, your feedbacks, uh, which will be for tomorrow. So I will leave you with this and uh, I will invite Professor Najam Hassan to carry on from this. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Yeah, we can't hear you still. That's true. Yeah, yeah one sec. He's just he's just setting something. Just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, today we are going to use Hubble Space Data. Uh, we will actually take some black. We'll take a lensing uh, galaxy, and we will use that lensing galaxy to actually estimate the amount of dark matter present. Right. What I'll just I'll just share my screen. One sec. It's not coming here. We can't see. We can't see your shirts. I'm unable to handle that. Then you come here, no? Come one sec. Yeah. Come. 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 I make some changes. But if it, you're not able to share it. You can close my speaker. Yeah, I suppose you can see it now. Yes, sir, we can see it. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. Uh, today we'll be talking about the dark matter and how to estimate it. So be, the hands-on session will be done by Dr. Priya Hassan. 
and uh, I will be just uh, introducing to you what is dark matter. And uh, some of us already know what we are talking about, but uh, for completion, we thought we'll have a quick look at what dark matter is. To understand what dark matter is, it is essential to understand what are galaxies. And uh, the astronomy always begins in a clear night under the clear night sky. And if you are lucky to be at a place where you can see this patch of light in the sky, the Milky Way, uh, you have got some idea, you have some understanding what are galaxies, right? So galaxies are large collections of gas, stars, gas, and dust. And when we say large, I mean, I mean billions of stars or 100 billion stars. So yesterday you looked at globular clusters and globular clusters or clusters of stars and clusters, open clusters have tens, fifties or thousands of stars. Globulars can have up to million stars. And uh, we are talking about galaxies which should have billions or more than billion stars. So that is 10 to the power of nine to 10 to the power of 12 stars. Yeah, that makes it a galaxy. Uh, our understanding of uh, what galaxies uh, uh, it took quite a while. The, the first map of our Milky Way galaxy was done by William Herschel in late 1700s. And uh, William Herschel, you can see the map which you see below this picture. Uh, that was the map which Herschel drew of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. And the beautiful part of this is he shows that a Milky Way galaxy back then in 1700s is some kind of a disk-like structure. But uh, there were two problems uh, which did not give Herschel exactly the right picture. One was he assumed that all stars have equal brightness. And second, he did not take into account the interstellar absorption. So because at that time, people did not realize that uh, the vast distances between stars can contain uh, interstellar medium, however, however much uh, rare medium it may be. But since it's a very big stretch, it does uh, make a difference to the starlight which goes through it. There's absorption by this interstellar medium. So a bright star uh, hidden behind or light coming through an interstellar medium can get absorbed, can get scattered, and you can, uh, you can get an impression that that star is very far, right? So at that time, people thought that just all stars have equal brightness. So if a star looked faint, he thought it was because it was far. And if it was bright, he <coughs> assumed it was close by. And by using this technique of star gagging, he made a structure of this kind. And Herschel, he put the, our sun at the center of this disk. So he, he thought that our sun belonged to this ocean of stars, but it is sitting at the center because there was a limit when he looked in either direction because of absorption and scattering, he could see only to a certain distances. And uh, this is what he, right? And today we realize that the assumption that all stars of equal brightness is wrong. Some stars are much brighter than the other. Yesterday you have seen the HR diagram and you've seen stars um, uh, of different spectral types at different temperatures, right? And uh, you must have even discussed about the interstellar absorption and correction, which you have to do. So, before we proceed with the story of uh, our Milky Way galaxy and galaxies in particular, uh, uh, let me tell you about William and Carolyn Herschel, the brother-sister pair, who did a lot of, they had the finest uh, telescope of those times. And in 1747, he had established his last telescope and his sister helped him with very meticulous uh, observations 
Uh, Caroline was interested in comets and together the brother and sister looked at a lot of nebulae. They investigated, they have made surveys of double stars, they have published catalogs of nebulae. In 1802, they had 2,500 objects and by 1820, they had 5,000 objects. So they meticulously saw nebulous objects and you and they drew those patterns we just saw. So there was some understanding, they did get an idea that these nebulae were made up of a multitude of stars. So if coming back to the uh, William Herschel's Milky Way map, which we saw in the previous slide, uh, you see what we were seeing is only a part of the actual Milky Way as we understand today. The green dashed line, which you see in this picture here, gives you the extent of our Milky Way as we understand it today. And Herschel, because of the technology of those times, was seeing only a small portion of it. Uh, right, and as we have said, Herschel thought that our sun was at the center. One estimate which was wrong was he thought a galaxy was much smaller than it actually is. Secondly, he thought that the sun was at the center of it because they, he could see only, you know, almost equal distance on either sides before there was obscuration uh, playing a role. Shapley, in the, uh, in the 20th century, he looked at globular clusters and he located, he saw that these globular clusters are, are, are distributed spherically and the center uh, does not coincide where the sun is. So Shapley uh, showed that uh, our sun is not at the center of our Milky Way, but it is somewhere else. In 1920s, there was a big debate going on between Shapley and a young astronomer, uh, William uh, Curtis. Uh, Shapley believed that Milky Way was the only galaxy in the universe, while uh, uh, Curtis thought that there were many other galaxies other than ours. And in 1920s, this issue was settled by observations of uh, Hubble and Hammerson, where they saw, they looked at the Andromeda galaxy, and they used, uh, uh, they looked, they found some sea feed variables uh, and estimated the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and showed that the distance to Andromeda is much, much beyond the extent of our Milky Way, right? So this, uh, uh, the sea feed variables, as you all know, was discovered by Henrietta Levite. And she saw that there are certain variable stars which have a, they follow a very strict luminosity period relationship. That is, these stars are variable stars which become bright and they become faint and they pulsate. They are pulsating, uh, varying, they vary their brightness. And by looking at the periodicity, you can exactly estimate what is its absolute magnitude. And what we observe sitting on Earth is the apparent magnitude. And by using the distance modulus, m minus m equal to 2.5 log d, right? That formula which you must have seen yesterday, you can make an estimate to uh, the C feed variables. So these C feed variables are very good distance indicators. And these C feed indicators were used even by uh, Shapley. He saw some sea feeds in 93 globular clusters and mapped out the distances and showed that our sun was not at the center of a galaxy, right? So at this point, Shapley was right that our sun is not at the center of a Milky Way, but he was wrong in his idea that the Milky Way was the only galaxy, uh, right? So in 1920s, observations of Hubble and Hammerson showed that Milky Way is one among many other galaxies. So these are two uh, cartoons of our uh, Milky Way. Uh, looking at it face on, it looks, it has these beautiful spiral arms and looking at it edge, you see it as a disc. So you have a disc, you have the central bulge and you have a halo. And uh, the disc is the place where you have a lot of gas, star formation is going on 
And that's where you see the open clusters, the young open clusters, which we discussed briefly yesterday. And the globulars which you see, where you plotted the HR diagram of globular cluster, these are distributed in the halo of the galaxy. And the central region, you see the yellowish one marked in this cartoon, gives you the bulge of the uh, of upper galaxy. Uh, so uh, now looking at these uh, pictures, one has to, yeah, so what people did was, uh, they looked at the motion of stars in the galaxies and they, they thought that the, uh, the rotational curve of the motion of stars uh, should follow a certain trend. So it was expected, let me share my whiteboard. Yeah, so we have a galaxy, right? And uh, this is the face on, this is the bulge, this is the disk, and you have the halo of it. Okay, so by looking away from the center, you look at stars at different distances, and you try to find out what the velocity is, right? And if you plot this, if you take the distance from the center, of a galaxy, distance from the galactic center, and you take the velocity of the y-axis, people expected that it should follow a, a certain trend. Because at the center, you have a lot of mass situated and a black hole there, which is getting the stars to rotate around it. So if you are close to the, right? So, uh, yeah. So. Uh, what was expected is for a rigid body, like a cycle wheel, a rigid body, like a disc or a cycle wheel, if you plot this radial velocity, you would see that it will follow a straight line. Right at the center, you have no velocity because it's your axle. And as you go further away, you would see that the velocity increases because basically uh, the whole wheel rotates about the center at the same time, the time taken by this point and the time taken by this point to go around uh, is the same, while the one which is below is having a smaller r. So your 2 pi r is smaller for the inner circle, while for the, for the outer circle, uh, your r is larger and your 2 pi r is larger, hence, 2 pi r by, by uh, the time taken, which is the same for both, uh, you see that the, this will take, this will be faster while this will be slower. No, uh, the other way around. The one which is outside will go faster. I mean, it has covered more distance in the same time than the one inside. So that's how you see that there's a linear relationship. But if you look at the planets, uh, what you see is, it follows this kind of a curve. That is, Mercury, which is closer to the sun, goes faster. It completes a, a revolution around the sun in 88 days, while Earth will take 365 days. And if you go down further to Pluto, it will take 243 years or so, right? So it follows this kind of a law, this kind of a curve. And it's essentially because uh, the, the gravity, which is close to the sun, is higher because gravity goes by one by r square, the force of gravity. And the uh, objects which are close, there's uh, greater gravitational force, so it has, they have to travel faster, otherwise they would fall into the sun. And as you go further and further away from the sun, they move slower, right? So what was expected is, if you are trying to look at our galaxy and draw the rotation curve, they expected that at the, Actually, this should, uh, yeah, my x-axis, I better coincide somewhere here, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so uh, we, what would we, we expect that here there's so much of matter which is squeezed in, so it should act almost like a rigid body. So they expected that the rotational curve should rise up like as in a rigid body, but after some time it should fall and it should fall like in the planetary system where the gravity as you go to the objects which are further and further off, the, the force is weaker here. Hence, they have to move slowly. So people expected the rotational curve should be of our, of our, our galaxy and other galaxies should show, fall by uh, this curve. Yeah, but uh, there was this observations of Vera Rubin, who lived between 1820s to 2016. Uh, she was an American astronomy astronomer and she looked at the like, rotational curves of galaxies and she showed that there is a discrepancy about what is the predicted angular motion of galaxies and the observed motion by studying their rotational curves and this phenomena become known as the galaxy rotational uh, problem and was evidence of existence of dark matter right so if uh, Yeah, so the observed uh, rotation curves which uh, Vera Rubin got was shown in the red. So this is the rising part as we had expected it rises. But after a while, we thought that it should fall down. The green one was the rotational curve which was expected, but observed was this. And this indicated that there should be more matter in our galaxies other than what we are observing from the uh, from uh, uh, illuminated stars uh, because if there was no matter and the velocities are high then the star should escape our galaxy so since the velocities are high it was realized that uh, our galaxy was actually sitting uh, in a large in a very large halo uh, of dark matter. So it was realized that though we are observing, though we are observing our galaxy's extent to be of a certain type and we have certain estimates and observations of globular clusters and we see that this is, this is the extent of our galaxy, but the rotational curves don't indicate that this is the size. And they realized that they are sitting inside very large uh, halos. And there's a, this halo where you do not see any matter, but their existence has to be there. Otherwise, the stars, the rotational curves cannot uh, straighten out. The st stars here should escape. So there has to be much more so and the estimate showed that there should be at least 90 percent more matter beyond the visible matter which we are seeing okay so this was the evidence of uh, dark matter and what is dark matter dark matter is matter which cannot be detected we are unable to detect it in uh, visible light we are unable to uh, see it in x-ray right or or radio in fact we are unable to observe it in any of the uh, uh, wavelength of electromagnetic spectrum but the existence is shown uh, gravitationally and the same issue happened with the clusters of galaxies so yeah, so these class like like we realize our sun is a part of a solar system. Uh, our our Earth is a part of a solar system, and our sun belongs to hundred billion stars, two hundred billion stars, which forms a Milky Way galaxy. Like these these many galaxies, they huddle together to form clusters of galaxies. So our Milky Way galaxy resides in a cluster which is called the local group which has about 54 more galaxies 
Andromeda being the other major galaxy. So there are two major galaxies there, uh, which is Andromeda and our uh, Milky Way. And there are many other dwarf galaxies. In fact, many more galaxies are being observed as the technology is improving and our detection rates are improving. So this is what we were talking about, that this was the expected uh, rotational velocity, the rotational curve, while what we observe is this. And further, with the uh, observations of uh, hydrogen gas distributed, observation from the 21 centimeter line, we saw that our galactic curve is uh, not at all falling as expected, but rather seems to be rising. So that indicates that there should be matter because if there was no matter, there was nothing which controls the gravitation, uh, this gravitation, then how can they be traveling at these velocities, right? So dark matter, uh, as we, uh, I mentioned that about 90% of matter was required further to estimate this. And uh, coming back to the uh, clusters of galaxies, if you measure the velocities of these galaxies, uh, uh, we expect that it should satisfy something called the virial theorem. This, these systems are very old dynamical systems and they have remained so for a long period of time. So there is a relation which shows that twice kinetic energy, total kinetic energy plus the potential uh, should be zero, right? And uh, what it shows that again in these, uh, uh, in these clusters of galaxies, you require another 90% of matter to be present which is not being detected, uh, which can explain, which could satisfy uh, the expected virilization of these systems. So dark matter, most of the matter of our galaxy is not visible to us. The visible uh, mass is called, the, this invisible mass is called dark matter. And no one knows uh, what this is uh, made up of. And it makes up almost 90% of our Milky Way mass. And not just of our Milky Way, but for most galaxies, in fact, for all galaxies, the estimates that, that they should have another 90% of mass, uh, this is consistently showing a requirement of 90% more than what you actually see. So the most important question uh, of modern astronomy is how, what is this dark matter? And, yeah, so, how can we detect dark matter? Yeah, you'll be doing from there. Mm -hmm. I should continue on. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, how do we detect this dark matter? One of the ways is by by lensing. So, by the Einstein's theory of uh, general theory of relativity, we know that presence of matter, uh, it uh, warps space and time. So, uh, which was proved to be right by observations of Eddington, of the, uh, the famous experiment of Eddington of, at the time of solar eclipse, where uh, stars which were hidden behind the sun, he had predicted that they should get shifted due to the uh, presence of this matter and uh, yeah so it was predicted yeah so you are familiar with this general theory of relativity prediction that if you have if you the space which you have yeah if you imagine a a net and you throw a ball into it, this, this thing would get warped, right? There's a warping of space and time. And what was expected is at the time of solar eclipse, if you have an observer sitting here and there are stars behind the sun, because of the presence of the sun, there's a, it changes its, the space acts as a lens and we would think that the star is somewhere there. Okay. 
and uh, this kind of graph lensing was uh, is very well studied when you have large amounts of sitting here so if you have a, a, a neutron star it should warp space or if you have a massive black hole or if you have a galaxy you have a whole galaxy uh, so the light coming from objects far behind it it gets shifted right there's a grab lensing which occurs and you expect these objects you can see multiple images of the same thing and this kind of confirms that you you have yeah so there's a animation which shows how a galaxy cluster how is gravity like nature's magnifying glass Muted. Noted. To find out what the universe was like in the beginning, we need to study. Yeah, so I'll, I'll play it. I'll play it again. This will explain to you what is uh, grav lensing. Like nature's magnifying glass. To find out what the universe was like in the beginning, we need to study the most distant galaxies whose light has been traveling to us for billions of years. But the farther away a galaxy is, the fainter it appears. That makes distant galaxies very hard to see, even for the most powerful telescopes, because they can only collect so much light. Fortunately, nature can provide a helping hand. According to Einstein, the gravity of massive objects can be so intense that it can warp the fabric of space-time. Light, which normally travels in a straight line through space, can show us where this distortion occurs. A very massive object will warp space and bend the path of the light. In a sense, warped space acts like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass collects and bends light, making a light bulb, for example, appear bigger and brighter. Warped space can do the same thing to light from a galaxy. So what acts like the biggest magnifying glass in space? Galaxy clusters are the most massive things in the universe with the most gravity. When light from a very distant galaxy passes through a cluster, it is amplified and distorted, with the cluster acting like an imperfect magnifying glass. Light that would have gone in other directions gets bent toward our telescope. That lets us see the very distant galaxy in more detail. This effect is called gravitational lensing. Without this natural boost from gravity, it would be impossible for our telescopes to see far away enough in space and time to study galaxies in the early universe. The Hubble Space Telescope has made use of gravitational lensing to see many distant galaxies. And the larger James Webb Space Telescope will be able to find galaxies even fainter and farther than we've ever seen. With Webb, we will look for the very first galaxies to form and really learn about the early universe. Yeah, so that was a, a beautiful movie, uh, which explains what gravitational lensing is, how the curvature of space uh, uh, makes presence of matter uh, act as lenses and uh, and the basic exercise today uh, which we'll be doing is to be using these grav lenses to uh, to estimate uh, by using grav lensing you are taking over from me. yeah so uh, these are images of certain uh, grav lensing. So if you have a intermediate uh, a galaxy in between objects, which are, you have a certain quasar sitting very far off because of the lensing, you can see multiple images of this. So there are many instances which, when these things happen. So these are uh, images of grav lensing and uh, what we see uh, the Einstein in cross, yeah, and basically the same object, same object, these four images which you see, they are basically the images of the same object which is sitting behind this, this bright 
uh, objects in front. And you also have a phenomena called this Einsteinian ring. So if you have uh, this uh, grab lens created by a massive object, you have a source behind, you have these multiple images and it creates the phenomena of this. And they are, these are all images from the Hubble Space Telescope of grab lensing. You can see the distorted images which you see on the side. It's the image of the same and same object. So these are images of objects which are essentially hidden behind a line of sight, far beyond this uh, galaxy which is in front, right? And here you see the beautiful Einsteinian ring, right? So depending on how we are placed with respect to the, uh, the galaxy and the object behind, uh, you can see the whole ring or you can see it in uh, right you whether you see it a perfectly symmetric one or you see streaks of it or a certain yeah so a position where we are so Einstein rings encircling the lensing galaxy the lenses are the central galaxies often they are colored red or yellow because they are usually elliptical and they are older stars in this population and the lensed images are arranged around the lenses and are often bluer, either because they are quasars or star forming spiral galaxies in the early universes. So from here, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, Dr. Priya Hassan will continue. But before that, uh, let's take questions if there are any. If there are any questions, I would be happy to uh, answer them. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, so actually, uh, I have a question related to the rotation curve. So uh, you have said uh, in the uh, universe, at the center we have a black hole, that's a massive black hole. Uh, and you said uh, you treated it like a rigid object. That's why we got that linear thing. But still, it's so much of massive. Uh, you have said because of the dark matter thing, we have observed that flat line, approximately constant curve later on because we expected a fall. But we got uh, the constant thing because of the dark matter thing. So shouldn't we have that constant thing uh, in the initial stage also that linear thing should also distort because of the um, black hole thing because it's so massive. So that effect shouldn't consider at the initial stage also. You mean uh, you mean when you are looking at uh, when you are looking at the galactic uh, system that I will try to do a neater job. Yeah, you mean to say when we are drawing the curve, why is it rising like this and then falls? So even here, you don't expect this to rise. This is what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, no, this is, yeah, see, essentially, this is in a very small region of our, uh, very close to the galactic center. And we have a 3 million solar mass black hole sitting right in the center. So here, it is almost acting as a rigid body. You know, they are in a very small region. But as you go further and further off, then you see that it goes by, you know, one by R square law comes in. So this is only in a very small narrow region where you are very close to the uh, galactic center and there the matter is very densely packed it's almost like a uh, it, that's the core of the galaxy right so this is where you are you are it's behaving as though it's it's like a, a cycle wheel right like a rigid body like a rigid body but this is yeah so the rise is not too far this thing is very small very close to the galactic center and after that it we expect it to fall but what we are seeing is this kind of a thing, which shows the presence of dark matter. So actually, there. Uh, let me mention one more thing. There, there are certain class of astronomers, they do not believe in dark matter. They say that since dark matter cannot be observed in any other way, except for the gravity, gravitation forces it shows, they said that probably there is a, a lack of proper understanding of what gravities, right? So uh, they came up with modified Newtonian gravity. 
want right they came up with a theory where they showed that uh, by modifying they said that newton's law of gravity which we say is proportional to m1 and m2 yeah if there are two masses m1 and m2 the force is proportional to the product and square of the distance they said that this probably is true only in certain limits right and which is which is in a way right because uh, when you come to the motion of pluto the perihelion pass uh, of, uh, of the shift of the perihelion of pluto by 43 seconds of arc per century cannot be explained by newton's gravitational law right so there is this uh, feel that to certain extent for certain bodies yeah so we are already observing that when we come very close to a massive body like the sun then it's failing in the case of mercury while if you go further off mercury venus earth mars pluto it's working fine so they said that our uh, uh, gravitational law which we are using is not proper and it should be modified and they modified it and they could explain why these curves they uh, flatten out as they go further up or rather they are rising uh but and they also but the problem is uh, when they start wanted to apply this mon to uh, the virilization problem of clusters of galaxies they again had to tweak this mon a little bit so constantly modifying your theories to suit one system or the other is is a bad game in uh, sciences in sciences people believe something in occam's razor where your theory should be simple and powerful the simplicity has uh, much more uh, strength in and to understanding nature than right so this mon theory though there are still people who believe that the, the there's no dark matter and we have to understand gravity in a different way in a better way and they feel probably gravity in close proximity is it acts as uh, attractive while you go further off it should be repulsive but these bond theories are not being accepted by the mainstream uh, scientists right so uh, yeah so basically that's what i wanted to say and i don't know whether i have answered your question you are convinced with what i was trying to say in when you are looking at the rotational curves very close to the center your matter is very tightly packed so it is it is acting as though it's a rigid body and then it it falls down right it was expected to fall down but okay okay thank you sir yeah yeah anything else yeah so if not then uh, uh, i'll hand over to dr priya hasan uh, she will take up the tutorials okay so um, thank you thanks najan and uh, I can see another question, but um, just by R W, maybe Y B. So I, I think, sir, uh, kind of answered it. There's a question on. I'm somehow confused with dark matter being not being detected. So this is basically what it's all based on: that the dark matter shows its effect um, gravitationally, but does not show it in terms of luminosity. And that's exactly what we are going to work with today. Is that? Um, <clears throat> You will have this dark matter which is working gravitationally, but not in terms of luminosity. Okay, so uh, we are going to do two methods. The gravitational lensing will let us measure the gravitational effect of the the galaxy, and the luminosity. We are again you're going to use APT tool today. We are going to measure the luminosity of a galaxy, which that will give us the luminous mass, which is not which which the dark matter doesn't express itself like that. So when we want to look for the dark matter in a galaxy, we are going to assess the, ma the mass using both properties. One is the grav lensing, and the other one is the luminosity, right? 
So now for today's tutorial, I hope everybody has DS9. I need you all to have DS9 as well as I need you to have the APT tool again today. So today we won't be using so much of the APT tool. We'll be using it very little. So in case you have a problem in it also, don't worry. You can just take the value I get from it and you can use that, right? So uh, I'll continue from where Sir left was uh, you all spoke about gravitational lenses, right? And uh, we are gonna focus now today on on an Einstein's ring. So if you actually look at this image over here, what do we have? We, um, yeah, if I actually see this image, here's the observer. This is the lensing galaxy and the source is actually behind it, right? So what happens is that because this lensing galaxy has a certain amount of matter, which is the luminous matter plus the dark matter, therefore the light coming from the source gets bent towards the galaxy when it comes to the observer. And the observer, when the observer looks and sees a rays of light coming in this direction, the brain of the observer extrapolates this and says that there's a source over here, right? Now, this will happen. There's not going to be this one ray coming from this object. There are going to be many rays coming from this object. And all of them will lead to different points along this thing. You have to remember that an Einstein's ring will only occur when you have a perfect alignment, right? So not in all cases, only when you have a perfect alignment, then you will get this ring formation. In other formations, you may even have what we spoke about was the Einstein's cross, right? So the Einstein's cross, in this case, you will get four images of the galaxy. But in an Einstein's ring, if you have this perfect alignment of the lensing galaxy and the source, each ray coming from the source is going to be bent by a different amount. So when the observer looks, he sees a ring, okay? which is called the Einstein's ring. So you can see, you can see these beautiful images. These are from Hubble Space Telescope using the advanced camera for surveys. And this actually shows you a ring around the galaxies. Okay, and uh, so therefore you can see this ring over here and this is called ring. Now, uh, what you need to notice in this is that the lensing galaxy, So you can see the lensing galaxy, which is closer to you, is often an elliptical kind of a galaxy. So you can see it's kind of reddish, yellowish, while the, the, the source which we have, which is much more behind, which is either a quasar or, uh, or a galaxy, spiral galaxy at a large redshift, and hence it is blue in nature, because we know that at the redshift two to three, you had very high star formation. Due to which there are lots of young stars over here. It's a blue galaxy. And this blue galaxy, the image is getting stretched out and coming out like this. So this is the source. And in the center, the yellowish reddish thing, which you see is actually the, um, the lensing galaxy, right? So we have to remember that there are two things. One is the lens, the lensing galaxy. And the other one is the source, uh, which, is being, which is giving you the ring, right? And, uh, so what we are going to do today is we are going to estimate the amount of dark matter using the effect of a gravitational lens. And we will also find the mass and the fraction of dark matter, etc. Right? So first of all, you're getting from this lensed galaxy. So this is the formula which we are going to use is that the lens has a certain angular diameter, right? Which is theta E, okay? So this is the formula which tells me that for the galaxy, which has this um, lens effect, you have 10 power 12, theta e divided by two, this is arc seconds, two arc seconds squared into d, the distance divided by 3000 megaparsecs. Actually, this is a more um, accurate uh, formula. You may find many such formula, but you need to keep in mind that in this formula, I'm sorry, this should have been small, DSL is the distance between the source and the lens, okay? DSO is the source and the observer, and DLO is the lens and the observer, right? So if we look at it in this image, you can see it in this image. Here I have the observer, here I have the lensing galaxy, here I have the source. So like I said, DSL is the distance between the source and the lens. LO is the distance between the lens and the observer, and SO is between the, the source and the observer, right? But in this case, we have to now keep in mind that in this, these cases, we are talking about very large scales, for example, the scale of megaparsecs. And therefore, 
what happens in this case is we cannot say that my DLSO is equal to DSL plus DLO. Why? Because space has actually got curved, right? You, you all saw that video which Sir showed you for gravitational lenses, where you saw that, saw that space curve actually curved, and therefore it doesn't add up like this, right? It doesn't perfectly add up, and therefore it get, it, we have to add it in a slightly more complicated manner, right? Which I'm going to show you. But the first step in that, what we need to do is we need to, first of all, download the data and we need to measure theta E. So I'm going to stop this share, right? And I'm going to now share my browser. So please, everybody go to your browser, right? I hope you can, maybe I'll, uh, it's better if I'll share my complete screen. Let me share the complete screen. And I hope you can see my browser, right? Uh, like I told you, we are going to use Hubble Space Telescope data. Can you see my browser? Can you see the browser? No. Yes. So um, we are yes, going to use Hubble Space Telescope data. Yeah. If you remember, must, right? We did it for the first day when we did exoplanets. So I already have it over here. You can type this, uh, this, this uh, address, must.stsci. This is the Space Telescope Science Institute dot edu right if you google it also you can do that so do must mast dot stsci dot edu we'll go on to this website we've already seen this website the first day when we were doing exoplanets right so that's our website which is loading up on here right okay now what we want to do is we want to look for our lensed galaxy right? now i already know that there is hubble data available for lensed galaxies and I'm going to look at that, right? So what you're going to do is click on advanced search, okay? Please click on advanced search, right? And in this case, we already know the proposal ID of the gravitational lens source. If you want to, you can actually find it through the net various other ways, but uh, let's say we know the proposal ID because I've already checked it up in advance for this class. So you can just type 10494. This is the proposal ID, which was basically for gravitational lensing. Okay. So what happens with the Hubble Space Telescope is that if you want observations with Hubble Space Telescope, you have to basically write proposals. And your proposal has to explain the science case, that is, what is it that you want to observe with Hubble, and how are you going to do it? And typically your proposal would be like, you know, a four or five page thing, which describes the science case. It describes what kind of data do you want? How will you be collecting the data? As well as um, what are the results you expect to get from it, right? And therefore, uh, you accordingly write proposals and Hubble will, if the proposal is accepted, Hubble will observe it for a certain proprietary period, six months or one year, it will reserve that data for you and then after that, it actually gives the data out freely to uh, anybody else, because it's possible that somebody else may use that data for something else. Obviously, in this, what happens is you cannot exactly repeat what was there in the proposal, because the people of the proposal should have hopefully done that, right? You can do something additional with that. So once you've written your proposal ID, please click on search, right? Click on search right and i hope you can see a screen like this now over here on the right you can see in this proposal what was all the data that was got and you can see that there were various targets you can see target name okay so you can see gal there are various galaxies which were observed in this proposal okay so you can see gal 0364 whatever whatever you are going to scroll down and come to the galaxy which we are interested in, which is here. Oh God, sorry, it's loading and hence it's getting lost. So we are going to look at these, this galaxy, which is 668, okay? So please look at this, 668. It's shifting because the uh, it's loading all the other things which were observed in this proposal, right? So let it all load and uh, then we can stop it. So uh, this is our thing, 668, right? And uh, you can see 
that, oh God, this is still loading. You can see this is a galaxy which is observed optical and you can see that it's basically observed in <clears throat> I'll have to go up. Yeah, and I hope it's done at all. Okay, so here you're seeing 668. Oh God, this is still loading. Right, it is still loading. I think the net is a little slow today and hence it's not done at all. I hope it's finished. Right. So when we, uh, we see through target name, you can see over here, let's look for 668. Right. Yeah. So what you can see over here, that this is 668, this is observed in two filters. So Hubble, what it does is that when it observes in filters, the filters get names like this. So first you write F, that means a filter. Then 555, that is the wavelength in nanometers, right? So this is a tenth of an angstrom. So this would actually be 5,550 angstroms, which is 555. And then the filters can be wide or they can be medium or they could be narrow. So narrow band filters are specifically put on a certain spectral line, right? But these are what are called broadband filters or what we called wide filters. So we have 555 and we have 814, right? So what we're going to do is we are going to move over here. And if you remember, just like we did it in exoplanets, you'll move over here, click on these two, right? Click on these two. In my case, it's 95, 96, right? Images 95, 96. You can see these are images from the ACS camera. ACS is the advanced camera for surveys, right? And uh, of the HST, Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that they are in these two filters. 555 and 814, right? It's the same galaxy being observed. So remember exactly like we did in exoplanets, please click on this. So this is done like some kind of Amazon shopping. I click on this. So this big, this goes into my basket, right? So I'm basically selecting these things and I've got them into my basket, right? And now before when I want to download it, I need to click on this and this, this is the data I want. And you can see the download button. So I'll click on download and I will say zip file and I'll say download, right? So let me just check has everybody managed doing the step or is there a doubt or a problem? Please let me know if you're having a problem, uh, then I can help you. So should I repeat the steps? Uh, Ma'am, please uh, show the download process again. Yeah, so once you've made the shopping basket, now click, right? Click on this one and two. And immediately now this download button gets highlighted. When you did not click on this, right? You see the download button is not highlighted. But now if you click on HST and HLA, then you can see the download button, right? Before, and you click before, on this. Before. before this step, okay. So I'll repeat from this thing, is you are going to go on to this part which says advanced search, okay? Click on advanced search, okay? And on advanced search, I can click it again and show you. You can search for things on various ways. So what we are going to do, see, you can search for data either by object name or the type or the mission or various things. We are going to look using proposal ID. So the proposal ID we are going to write is 10494. Okay. So you are going to use the proposal ID and then you'll click on search. Right? So click on search after you did proposal ID. And here, this is showing you all the observations which were made based on that proposal ID, which is 10494. So if you scroll over here, you'll see the target names, right? There are various galaxies. So you can see gal this, gal that, whatever. And I have requested you to scroll down and come to this galaxy 668, right? So 668 is the one which we need. And uh, everything is not yet loaded. And that's why you can't see both the files just now, which we want. But I'll just wait for a minute and those files will come. This is the first file, which is the optical, the image in 814 filter for this Galaxy 668. 
and gradually you'll see that the other ones will also appear. Uh, they are loading. It's just that there's a lot of data and that's why it's, you know, seems to be taking time. So it will all load, right? And then you are going to look for these two files, one which is there with 814 and one which is there with this. So I will, if you click on target name, it sorts it on the basis of target name. So you click on this, sort it, it's sorting it. And now you'll see all the 668s are together. So uh, here, scroll down, yeah, here's 668, right? So you can see 668, it's there are two images. One is in 555. This is the uh, wavelength, this is the filter which has 5,550 angstroms. And this is the other wavelength, which is 8,140 angstrom. So this is in nanometers, which is given over here, and uh, 555 and 814. So now I go on the left, and I click these two boxes, right? 95, 96. Hopefully, all of you should also have the same number if everything is loaded, right? It may take you a little while for all the things to load, right? For all the data to load, but you will click on 95, 96. And after this, you'll click on the shopping basket. So this basically thinks that this is the shopping basket you want or the download basket. So I click on this, which is the download basket. And now in my download basket, I have the files only for these two images, which are there using um, HST, right? And now what I'm going to do is these boxes. These boxes are what I'm going to click on, right? And now you'll click on download. And download would like to make a zip file in which it downloads both these things. So you'll make a zip file and click on download. Right. So uh, <clears throat> I have already downloaded this. So I'll show you the location where I have this. And uh, right. So here is my zip file. All you need to do is you need to right click and you say open with archive utility or whatever, however you are unzipping. So if you're unzipping because it's a Windows machine, you can double click it, you can do it like this on a Mac or you could uh, give the command unzip uh, if you're using Linux right. And once you unzip it, you'll see this gives you a folder. Okay, this is the folder. Double click on it and you'll see that there are two folders within this. HLA refers to the Hubble Legacy Archive and this is HST. So Hubble Legacy Archive already has processed images, right? So it's better to go in for HLA. And here you can see, these are the images for 555 and here are the images for 814. So let us go for 814, double click on this. And you can see that there are three images over here, right? We are going to open this DRZ image, which is the drizzled image. Okay, we are go going to open the DRZ image. How will we open it? If you remember, we've already spoken about DS9, right? DS9 is the tool we are using to visualize or to see. Um, what is this? Yeah, uh, somebody who's the Shankar Kamal is asking me. Yes, that's the galaxy we are looking for. Zero six six eight five two one six two four two eight. Correct. Right. Uh, yes, AT is asking me is the entire proposal and data receiving process free of cost or there's a difference? No. So in principle, even if now you want to put a proposal for James Webb Space Telescope, you can put a proposal. There is no age limit. There's no qualification limit and there's no cost. You don't pay anything to give a proposal, even for the billion dollar James Webb Space Telescope. What is done is that you give a proposal and the telescope has what is called a time allocation committee and the time allocation committee will assess your proposal see the scientific use of your proposal and based on that they will decide whether your proposal is worth it or not and depending on that you get data or you don't so you can put proposals not only for jwst or hst or other telescopes even in india you have to go to their website they will put up calls for proposals you can then give your proposal and it depends on how your proposal is you this thing it so for sending proposals and requesting data you do not need anything okay 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my DS9. If you remember, this is the icon for it. We downloaded it on day one and I'm going to open. This is my DS9. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I am going to, uh, right. So just a minute, I am going to uh, show you this image. This is the image. I hope all of you all can see it. I'll just get my mouse. You will need a mouse and uh, I'll just show that to you. So this is the image. Just Yeah, so I am back. Sorry for the this thing. But you see, this is the image. Has everybody managed to open this image? Please let me know. What are the filters we need? So in this, we've taken 555 and we've taken 814. So here you can see, this is our image. I hope you can see an image. If you have a mouse, you have to right click it. If you right click it, you can actually change the contrast on your image. So that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm using my mouse to right click it and change the contrast. Okay. Now this is the actual image. Now, how do we know where is our lensed galaxy? Right? So uh, I, I think I showed it to you the other day, where you actually if you want, you can, if you want to see the header of this, you can click on file, and you can say display header, right? I want to know now there are two header files, you used the sign one the science image see the, the header for that okay and here if you look that we need right so uh where is the ra and deck this is a shorter one right or oh, we know it from our um this thing actually we already know that ah here so here is the ra and the deck so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to search around over here. You can see here, as I move my mouse, I can actually see my sources, right? So I will actually uh, show you on this. Sorry, here is our source. So this source has an RA of 0, 02 hours, 16 minutes and 8 degrees 13, right? This is the details for our source, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search on this image for something at 0216 and 813. So you look up over here, here you can see you have it, right? So it's 813 and 0168. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in. And as you zoom in, I already know. So you can look at this. Beautiful, right? Look at this beauty over here. So here, what you see is this is our galaxy, right, with the lens. Now you can see the Einstein ring in this is not full, it's not complete, but nevertheless, it's there. Like I told you, to get a complete ring, you need perfect alignment. We don't have perfect alignment, and therefore, this is our source, right? So I hope you can use your mouse, adjust it to get a better contrast, right? Often one of the best scalings you can take is the log scale, which you can see is what I've used over here and the min max. I hope you all can see this thing well. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, I think it's yeah. So you can see this ring around over here. Now what I want to do is to measure the mass. I need to measure the radius of this ring. Okay, so what I'm going to do is please have a look at what I'm saying. So I'm going to click on region. Okay, so click on region and the shape is circle right and over here, if you see on edit, you may have it clicked on none, you should click on region. Okay, if you had none. Now if I click over here, you can see, I will end up getting something like this. I'm getting the region, I can drag it and I can get this thing right. 
So I'll repeat this. I'll repeat it again. You are going to click on edit. In edit, select region. Yeah. And then you'll click on region. In region shape, you select circle. Right. And once you've done that, you can just click on this image and you will get a circle. Now, if I want to increase the size of the circle, I will further click over there and I will pull it from these points. And here I'm going to pull it so that it exactly covers this ring. Right. So it exactly covers the ring and I get the ring. Right. Now, what I wanted to do was to find the radius of the ring and therefore I'll click on region. I will say get information and here is the ring. But I want the radius in arc seconds. So instead of degrees, I will change it to arc seconds. So now when I say region and I say get information, this is the size in arc seconds, right? So I think it's slightly smaller. We should have taken a slightly larger value. Okay, so you may get slightly different value depending on how you draw your circle, but here is the information we want. This is the important information we want. We basically wanted the radius of this uh, arc, right, in arc minutes of this, because we don't have a complete ring, but we wanted the radius of the arc. And that is 1.4 arc seconds. So please note this somewhere, write it down somewhere, that you have 1.4 arc seconds, right? 1.4 arc seconds is our radius, okay? Now our work with DS9 is done. So I'm going to close DS9. I hope everybody's managed the DS9 part. Um, in the chat, you can tell me if you haven't. Um, does anybody have a problem? Uh, okay, I don't see any more messages. So I hope you all have got this. I'm going to close this. Okay. okay. Now what happens is I want to find out this. So for the total mass, if you remember, this is the formula 10 power 12. This is theta e. Our theta e is 1.4 arc seconds, okay? Divided by two arc seconds. And here I need the distance. Now, how do I get this distance? I told you that in our case, that when we are getting this distance, the distance is more complicated because of cosmology, right? And therefore, when we want the, this thing, yeah, see, we also need this thing that you know that we know in advance that for this lensing galaxy, the redshift of the lens is 0.332 and the redshift of the galaxy, the source, sorry, the redshift of the lensing galaxy is 0.332 and the redshift of the, um, what do you say, of the source is 0.523, right? So there's a difference in both the redshifts, okay, that I have. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we are going to use to get the value for these cosmological distances. This is the distance when I want to find it out between the source and the lens. Now, in principle, it would have been uh, distance SO minus distance LO, right? But because we have a, a redshift, there's a curvature of space time, and therefore we do not, we have to add the redshift factor, which is this. So we need to have these two numbers. These are what are called the co-moving radial distances. So I need the co-moving radial distance of the source and the co-moving radial distance of the lens. How do I get this? To get this, I've got to go back to my browser. So I'll go back to my browser, right? And here I can close this stuff because I've already got the data, right? And here, how do I do cosmological count, uh, you know, calculations? That's a difficult job. And therefore we are happy that there is a net right Right, so you have to just type this thing with me. There's a net right cosmology calculator. Right, so you can look over here. It's Ned, sorry, not new right, but Ned right. Ned right cosmology calculator. So what this Ned right does is it basically does these calculations, cosmological calculations using uh, using some code and calculates things which are difficult for us. So you will click on this, and here's your Ned right cosmology calculator. So please click on this, right? This is what we are going to use to find out our distances. Now you can see that in this cosmological model, you have various parameters. This is the Hubble space constant. This is omega. Omega is the, the density ratio. Here is the redshift. You can have an open flat universe or a general universe. So what we're going to do is we are going to run this cosmology calculator for the source, which we know is at a redshift of 0.523. 
and for the lens, which is at a distance of 0.332. So let us first run it for the lensing galaxy, 0.332, okay? I hope all of you all have this uh, website. If you have an issue, I'm just gonna copy this website, right? I'll copy it and share it with you in the chat window. Okay, my whole thing is covered, so I can't see it. I will do it like this. I'll have to stop the share. So please see, I've shared the, um, the website for this NetRight cosmology calculator. Or it's there on your chat. And here you can see is my thing. So please note down these values. These values are what you need. You see, I've seen, I've done it for the lensing galaxy, which is 0.332. You have to note, first of all, look at this. You have to note this co-moving radial distance, which is, um, you have to note uh, 0.332. Okay, I'll do it general. Okay. So if I do this, you will note the values which we get over there. The luminosity distance, which is given over here, which is 1762.1, right? 1762.1, you have over here. And you have this, which is 993, right? This is 993.1, which is your angular distance. And um, you can see, um, we need this also which is the co-moving radial distance, which is 1322, right? So we need to note this, which is the co-moving radial distance, 1322. We need to have 993 angular size distance, and we need to have this one, DL, which is 1762, right? Which is the luminosity distance of the lensing galaxy, right? So please note down all these three values. 1322.9, 993.1, and 1762.1. Now we are similarly going to run this now for the source. I'm going to change the redshift, and my redshift will now be 523.523. And you'll press general. And now you get a new set of values. So please note this now. This is for the source. So for the source, what do we have? You have to note this that the co-moving radial distance is 1984, right? 1984.7. The angular size is 1303.1. The luminosity distance is 3022.6, right? These values, these values. So these are the three values which you need to note about the, and this, even the co-moving radial distance, you need to have all these values. So please note the co-moving radial distance is 1984.7. Um, the angular size is 1303.1 and luminosity distance is 3022.6, right? So let's say now that we have these values, right? I say we have these values. And if you see over here, I am showing you here the screenshot. I'll give you, I'll send this to you. This is for the lens. You've noted all these values and uh, for the source, which is behind it, that which has a redshift of 0.523, we have these values. And now what we do is we are going to use this to find out the total mass, right? So uh, when I did this earlier, I got theta E was 1.5, but we are now using 1.4. So you can use 1.4 or 1.5, whatever you like, right? And um, this is my value. Now this value, which we, I showed you the formula previously, which is this value, chi s minus chi l, we have found it out just now using the calculator. So I know this is 1984 minus 1322.9 divided by one plus z, this is the redshift, right? So 1984 plus this divided by this gives me 434. So this is 434.5 is this value, right? Which is my DSL, my DSL, is this 434, right? And uh, these things, these I found out from the calculator. We know that the source distance is 1303.1. I'm sorry, but all this is in mega years, in millions of years, uh, in terms of distance. This is the lens to object 
And the source to this thing, which we found out using this is 434.5. And these are the values which we have to substitute into this formula, right? So we are going to substitute that into this. So um, you will actually get, please use your calculators, right? Let's use your calculators and um, we can calculate these values, <clears throat> right? So what I'll do is I will share, I will show you my, I'll show you Chrome. And here, what we are going to do is we are going to do DSO multiplied by DLO. So my SO is 1303 multiplied by 993. So I will say, oops, sorry. I'm sorry. This is my browser, right? So I'm going to take 13, this thing, right? 1303 into 993, 1303.1 into 993.1, which I'm going to divide by, I have to divide this by 3000, right? Multiplied by DSL, which is 434.5, right? And this is my answer, which you can see it's 0 0.99. So you can see that this, this um, bracket part is 0 0.99. Now 0 0.99, I'm going to multiply into 1.47, multiplied by 1.4 divided by 2 squared, right? So let us do that. And um, I am going to do this. Um, one, first, I will do 1.4 divided by 2, right? I will square this, right? And I will multiply this by 1.4, sorry, 1.47. And I further multiply this into 0 0.99. So I get this, right? I got 0 0.71. Hmm. One minute. Okay, this, this answer is coming slightly different because I've taken slightly, uh, what we got just now, I showed you in Chrome, we got 0.71. But when I took 1.5, I got the value of 0.826. So let's just assume it's 0.826 because that's the value you get if you take theta e to be 1.5. We wrote it as 1.4. So this is 0.826 into 10 power 12. So now we know that the mass of the galaxy, which has caused the gravitational lens, is 0.826 into 10 power 12, right? And this mass obviously includes the dark matter, right? Because it has the it has the effect coming because of, um, you know, the gravitational effect, which will show in the lens. So this is my total mass, which is 0 0.826, 10 part 12. This we will remember. Now, the next step we need to do. So we know our gravitating mass, which is which includes the dark matter. Now we need to measure our stellar mass. How will we measure the stellar mass, right? We measure the stellar mass using photometry. If you remember, photometry is counting of the photons, right? So what we are going to do is we are doing a PT tool for the galaxy, for the lensing galaxy, and that will give us the mass of the galaxy based on its brightness, right? You know that the galaxy is made up of a whole bunch of stars, gas, and dust. And if I do the aperture photometry tool for the galaxy, I can get the brightness of the galaxy. And that's exactly what I do. So I will do this later on. I will convert it to uh, this thing. I am first going to go back to this. How will we do that? Now we are going to do that using APT tool, right? So I have my APT tool, which you all remember. Um, <clears throat> let me look for it over here. I'll look for APT, right? So here's my APT. I'm going to open my APT tool, right? So I hope uh, all of you all remember the APT tool. We did it on day one for exoplanets, right? Now we are going to use it for this lensing galaxy. So you'll say file and you say open image, right? And here, when I say open image, you have to again pick up the 814, that image. So I'm going to uh, look for the image open it from the location where you had it, right? Please, in case anybody's having any problems, please let me know. So this is this, and I'm gonna take it to TP3, day four, must, 
and I'm going to open this. And this is 814. And we're going to open the same file, which is this DRZ file, right? The DRZ file is the same file, which we opened with DS9 also. We are opening that now with APT tool. So I say open. So here in this window, you can see that there are more than one images. We'll take the first one. I hope that is the one which we need. If that's not the one. Yeah. So take the first image. And here is our image. Again, you can see that in this image, the contrast is not very good. Right. So you can see, okay, I think this is not the science image. So I'll have to open another image. Okay, so the first image is not the image. This is not the image. I'm going to open image. I will say this. You remember when we are doing this, it says open. And you have to take HDU2. This is HDU345. So the problem is we need to know which image do we want to take, right? So what you can do is look at the FITS header. If we look at the FITS header, right? Let's see the FITS header. Okay, but you first need to open the image. So I'm going to open the image again. This is open the first image. I don't want that. I'm going to open, I need to get the science image, right? So I'm going to take the next one. I think this is also not the right image. All these are bundled images. So we need to find the one which has our thing. That is not this also. It's not this image. Let us open the other image. So you can see that there are four images sitting in that. Some of them are the calibration images or some of them are even the error images. We need to pick up the right one. I should have actually that out which one was the one we needed it's not this let me try the last one i hope this gives this to us no this is not that i'm sorry i'm sorry we just uh, looking at all these images, I need to open the right image. There's only one which I haven't tried till now, which is the third image, which is HDU4. I hope that this is the one. No. This is not the one. One minute. I'm just going to open this image again with DS9 so that we get the right image. Let me open the image. I think these settings is what has created the problem. These color level settings. They are the ones which have created the problem, I think. Um, I think this one should be the one. Right. So let me let me change this lower bound. Please, you can go look at this and you can change the lower bound of the image. Right. And we can change the upper bound. Oh, yeah. Wow. Now we have our image. I'm sorry. So here is the image. It was the first one itself, right? And what we are going to do is let's look for our thing. The problem with APT tool is it, you know, it even with zero magnification, 
it's giving me this thing. So I've got to search for our lensing galaxy. Let us look for it. We know that it's on the right, right? It's on the somewhere here. Right, it's somewhere here. Yeah, this is our lensing galaxy. This is the one, right? You'll have to uh, spend some time actually to get these things. It is a little bit of a problem, I agree, but this is how we've got to do it. This is the lensing galaxy. Okay, and now what we basically want to do is we want to do photometry of the galaxy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click over here. Right, and that's my galaxy and exactly how we did it earlier, the first thing is we are going to go for more settings. Now more settings in this case, if you remember when we did globular clusters, we did non sky annulus, but in HST data, the sky correction has already been done, so you have to click on model A. Model A is no sky background subtraction because uh, for HST, the background subtraction has already been done. The other thing is the zero point. So let's look for the zero point. When you're looking for the zero point, you see I've already written this down over here that for HST, if you're using 814, the zero point is 25.53. If you're using 555, the zero point is 25.79. So we are going to go back there and uh, 25.53 and therefore I'm going to use that. Yeah, the zero point we will write is 25.53. Okay, and you'll say apply settings. Apply settings, close window, right? Now the next thing if you remember was the aperture, right? But now the aperture, what do we need to do? We need to do the aperture without this outside source. Right, so I'm going to see I'm increasing the size of the aperture. But I don't want it, I want it to be on the inner rim of the lens, right, so I'm going to take it on the inner rim of the lens, this is the lens, right, this is the source, this is not the galaxy, so I will slightly increase this, but do it in such a way that it does not get me light from this source galaxy, right, so slightly inside. If you see, it's slightly inside the, the ring because the ring I know is coming from the source galaxy. I want the light from this lensing galaxy. So this is my aperture, which I want, right? So I can directly say apply, okay? I'll say apply and I'll say close. Even this one is close, right? And now to get the brightness of this galaxy, I will click on recompute photometry. So I click on this. I'll close this and here you get 17.66 so this is the brightness of this galaxy right 17.66 i hope you all figure remembered all these steps the first step is more settings where you add put the zero point and you put the algorithm for sky the second thing is you set the aperture and the third thing is you click recompute photometry right so that will give me the apparent magnitude of this galaxy I hope this is clear to everyone, um, right? So I'm closing my APT and I'm going back to that. I'm sorry, these are all other presentations. I'm going to open ours, which is DM lens. Okay. So now to measure this, now I've got it 17.66, but the last step is I need to convert this to absolute scale. Right, because this was apparent magnitudes and you remember absolute apparent magnitudes are what is that you know that a galaxy is looking dead, you know fainter to you because it's further away right if it's closer to you it look brighter. So we are going to put them all at a fixed distance of 10 parsecs and that is what is called the absolute scale of galaxies right or for stars for whatever it is, so we want to convert the apparent magnitude which we had 17.66 I want to convert that to absolute scale. How do I do that? This is the formula. You remember we did this yesterday, m minus m is equal to five log d, right, minus five. But here, since our uh, uh, this thing is in mega parsecs, we now instead get, instead of five, we are getting 25 because I'm taking log of the mega parsec also, right? So I take this and I get 25 over here. 
and uh, this is my absolute magnitude. So my apparent magnitude is 17.66. My DL I know, right? DL I know it's 1762.1. That is the distance of the lensing galaxy, right? We've already found that out. That is this. Now I need to find out A and K. What is A? A is called galactic extinction. That because you have a galaxy at a certain distance from you, if you have interstellar matter between you and the galaxy, there would be some absorption and that is A. K is what is called the K correction. What is the K correction? That because you have a galaxy at a very large distance, right? Uh, we all know about the Doppler effect. Because of the Doppler effect, wavelength, you go on to longer wavelengths. So what we are looking at at 814 now must have actually started at some other wavelength. That means we need to correct for the wavelength, right? And that is what is called the K correction. So now our last step is just converting this to absolute magnitude for which we need to do A and we need to do K. So now let's first see how do we get the value of A. To get A, the amount of interstellar extinction, we go back to the net, okay? And we use something which we used the other day, which was called NED, NASA Extragalactic Database. Write NED Astronomy because otherwise we just write NED, all kinds of other things will come. So please write NED Astronomy. And this is it. So you click on this. Uh, we, I hope we've seen it earlier. This is my NED, right? And now what I need to do is this, if you see the tools, there are tools over here, we can do what is called extinction calculator. That means for the direction in which we have this galaxy, we can ask it for what is the value of A for that direction. So I will click on extinction calculator, right? Which is in under tools. Only thing is now I need to give the RA and the deck of my galaxy. And that we already knew, if you remember, we, uh, if we go back to our PPT and we'll, I'll have to scroll back here. This is our object. The RA is 0, 2, 16, 52.5 and the deck is minus 8, 13, 45.55. So I'm going to input these values in NED. So I, have, I just did it today. So it remembers what I put in. So the RA is this and the deck is this. Uh, I was making a mistake. The deck, you should never write it in hours. It is in degrees. So deck will be eight degrees, 13 minutes and this. Also, while you all are putting in your deck, please be very careful. If you cut paste, the minus sign is often different. You have to delete it and type the minus sign. Otherwise, it will come wrong. Okay. So please convert. This is in hours, minutes and seconds. This one is in degrees, minutes and seconds. Okay. So RA will come like this and deck will come like this. I will click on go. Right. So this is going to tell me the extinction in that direction of the sky. Right. When I give the RA and deck. And you'll see it's giving me the direction, the extinction in various filters. This is the U, B, V, R, I, etc. Various filters. I am interested in, if you worked with H SDSS data, you would have to take it from here. But here we are dealing with HST data where we are doing ACS data with 814. So that is this, right? So you can see 814 HS, HST ACS and you can see the galactic extinction is 0 0.057, okay? So you will note this 0 0.057, this is the value of A. Right, A is 0 0.057. Okay, great. So let's get back to our this thing. Um, if you look over here, I have put the NED this thing. You entered in your RA and your deck, and you get the value of 0 0.057. Now the last thing we need to do is we need to find K correction. Like I told you, what is K correction? is if I had a galaxy at a lower redshift, right? Say 1.2, we know that because of the redshift, the, the galaxy is getting shifted, the wavelengths, right? Which we call redshift. And therefore we need to correct. What we are now seeing in 814 must have been something else in reality. And these are the values. 
we already have tabulated values for the k corrections so for different redshifts we have the k correction now our galaxy is at the uh, we already have the redshift we know it is 0.332 right so i can approximately say that the correction is 0.27 right depending on whatever is the redshift this is specifically k correction for 814w right for hst acs 814w so you can find these values these these values are available and you will get it so for 0.35 it's 0.27 and that's what we are going to take so now we will substitute it in this formula this is our formula absolute magnitude is equal to apparent minus this minus 25 minus a minus k so we had 17.66 if you remember this was our value for um, the apparent magnitude of the galaxy minus five times log of dl if you remember dl for this galaxy was 1762.1 25 I copy it, A is 0 0.057, K is 0 0.27, and hence my final answer is 0 0.23.897. So that is the absolute magnitude of the galaxy, right? Now the last step is I need to convert this light to mass, right? I have said that my the galaxy is minus 23.897. I need to convert that to mass. And I convert that to mass using this formula. Okay. So if you hear you substitute and you write minus 23.897, right? Minus 23.897, you substitute it in this formula, you will get the mass of the stars which make up that lensing galaxy. So the mass of the stars which make up the lensing galaxy, you will get. I'm not going to do it now with the calculator because we are running a little short of time. It is 0.532 into 10 power 12. And obviously you can see that in our calculations, we saw that the mass of the galaxy <clears throat> was larger when we had the black hole mass. And now it's lesser when we have this, um, the light mass of the light, the, the stars of this galaxy. So now my dark matter, how will I get it? This is the total mass. This is the mass with the dark matter minus the mass of the stars, which is 0.532, which is 0.294 into 10 power 12. So this is the amount of dark matter in this galaxy, 0.294 into 10 power 12 M sun. If I want, I can also calculate the fraction of dark matter, which is 0.294 divided by the total mass, which is 0.294 divided by this, which is only 35.5%. So that means 35.5% of the galaxy is has dark matter. Now, um, <clears throat> so what are our results? We actually found the amount of dark matter. The amount of dark matter is the total mass of the galaxy minus the mass of the galaxy in, um, uh, you know, the stellar mass. We also calculated the fraction of the dark matter, 35.5. Now studies show that often galaxies have even 90% of the total mass of the galaxy, but this varies, right? This varies. We have got a slightly lower value and probably the value is lower because, uh, you know, the galaxy, if you actually, I can show that to you. Uh, let me, okay. Let me show that to you. Uh, if you remember, let us see it in DSS. In SAO image, I will show you. Let us open the file. Right, if you remember, when we looked at the galaxy, there was a lot of material around it, right? I'll show that to you. This is day two. I want day four and I want HLA and I want this. So if you remember, when we looked at our galaxy, right? I will change the scale to log, right? And uh, if you see, if I make it into, uh, let me use my mouse to change the 
I'm changing the contrast. If you remember, this is our lensing galaxy, right? So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to zoom in, show you our galaxy. This is our thing, right? But now if you remember when we did APT, we just took the central part. Now I'm going to show you that if I, for example, do another scale, right? This histogram scale. You'll see the galaxy looks so huge. That means the galaxy is coming actually there's part of the galaxy which is even beyond that lensing part right I can uh, let me show you once again, if I. Right. If we actually look at this. I'll just mark the region. This is the approximate region of the lens right now if I change it to histogram you can see the galaxy seems to be so much larger. And that is why most probably the amount, the estimate that we made of the mass of the galaxy is not correct, right? We have taken a much smaller mass and that's why we are getting this kind of an effect. So probably <clears throat> if we want to improve our results, right? We have to think of other ways in which we can improve our results so that we get a better value. But at least for the one that we have, we do have 35.5, right? So I will end with this. Uh, with the end where this is a list of gravitational lenses for which I am providing you the redshift of the lensing galaxy as well as the redshift of the source galaxy. And uh, so your assignment would be today's thing is a much more complicated thing because as you saw there were many aspects to doing this and therefore the only assignment I can give you is about repeating this thing for any other given galaxy. Okay any of these other lensing galaxies which are there over here. So the assignment is just to do something of that kind, right? Just repeat it. I agree that it was a little complicated today because we had to do a lot of, um, uh, you know, things, but uh, the thing is that I wanted to give you a taste of how, you know, going back and forth, using different tools, using different resources. You saw we used the netrite cosmology calculator, we used NED for extinction calculation, we used DS9 to find the radius of that um, the lens, we used APT tool to do the photometry. So what happens is it's like a bunch of tricks which astronomers know, there are a whole set of things which you can use for various purposes. And uh, in doing analysis, you may often use a combination of these things depending upon what they are. So I agree today was a little complicated because we used a lot of these things, but I basically wanted to give you all a flavor of how when you're doing analysis, you have to actually be very careful and very meticulously, you know, do things so that you, you're sure that you've done it all correctly, right? So I will share this, uh, um, you know, the presentation with you, where you see most of the steps I have mentioned it, and I hope that will be easy for you to repeat it for any of the other lensed galaxies, right? So I'll end with that. Uh, and uh, I'd be really happy to answer any questions if any of you all have any questions. Please let me know if you all have any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I can ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, like you have calculated the uh, galactic extension of coefficient A using that net astronomy tool, uh, the calculator tool. Yeah. Uh, you have given a table for p correction. Uh, what's the procedure to calculate that table, or how do you get that table so that we get to know the k value? Yeah, for, yeah. For so, specific... yeah. So actually, what happens is this case correction is a complicated thing because it uses a lot of general relativity, right? Because these are all cosmology models. You are not looking at a flat universe. You're looking at a curved, clear, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're looking at a curved universe. And therefore, um, you know, it's it's complicated. And therefore, what happens is you uh, you'll actually find papers where they give you the value of these, uh, you know, coefficients. Like I showed you that list, right? I'll show that to you again, where, um, you know, you they actually somebody has done the job. You cannot be doing it because it's a complicated job to do. But um, somebody does the job of actually finding the k corrections and these are people who specialize specifically in k corrections right 
So they have calculated and given it to you specifically for elliptical galaxies in the filter 814W, right? So generally, uh, like for example, I, if I were even working in this area, I would not do a K correction on my own because it's complicated. So what you have to do is you have to actually look for papers Right. Look in literature for values for K correction and use that. Right. So uh, because it's not a it's not a trivial thing. It's not very simple to do it. And uh, like I said, you need general relativity and all for that. And that's it. Uh, another question I saw in the chat was about the assignments. The assignment is to repeat this analysis for any one of these sources. We have done it for the first source. Right but you can repeat it for any one of the other sources. That is the assignment, which uh, somebody was asking that they're not this thing, uh, clear about the assignment. So assignment is for the list of sources, which I'll give you in the end, I'll, I'll send you this PPT file. You have to repeat it for uh, some other lensing galaxy, right? That's the, this thing. okay, okay, thanks. Uh, what about oh, any more five, questions? Please, please, oh. yeah. Uh, why does A hey, and K terms appear in this formula? Because we have uh, the magnitude thing and we are uh, because um, we have the distance thing, so we are subtracting that log term that thing appears over here. Why does A and yeah. K terms appear? Okay, so when we did it earlier, right? Yesterday when I did, I just did m minus m is equal to five log d minus five, right? So that is that that formula is an approximation. It works very well for sources which are close by, which are not very far away. But the problem is that in this case, in these lensing galaxies, we are looking at sources which are megaparsecs away, right? 1700 megaparsecs away. They're really very far, which is like 1 billion parsecs away, 1700, right? 1.7 billion parsecs. So therefore what happens is, that that basic formula which we did which was m minus m is 5 log d minus 5 that does not apply because then in that case because of cosmology right because of the curvature of the universe there are added effects so one added effect is because of interstellar extinction which is a right and the other effect is because of k correction that is the curvature of the universe and therefore uh, the problem is that um, uh like now when we are considering larger distances we need that but for example you remember that uh you know once again i'll show that to you if you see these numbers are not very large right they are smaller numbers but in astronomy or in any kind of science accuracy is very important right so if i were to if you remember here you see a value is only 0 0.057 right so it's in a hundredth of a magnitude Similarly, your K value is only 0.27. So these are smaller factors. They are not very large factors. But if, when we are looking for precise values, right? In astronomy, in any science, we always want precision, right? And the more precision, the better it is. We always uh, strive for better precision. So in that case, we then have to consider these things. If you had not considered A and K, your difference would have been barely 0 0.05 and 0 0.27, right? So you would have got a 0.32 difference. You would have had that. But um, but like I said, for accuracy, we need to consider it. If you were to present something like this without doing an A and K correction, you, you were, it would not be acceptable because people would tell you that at, at the scale of megaparsecs, you obviously have to consider those factors. You cannot neglect that, right? So it's just for higher precision for better values, right? You're just trying to get it at a better precision. That's why we are adding these two factors. 25 is coming because I'm converting DL instead of parsecs, I'm converting it to megaparsecs. So the log of megaparsec is coming in, which is causing this thing. So that's what's adding on to this, right? Okay, yeah. ma'am. Uh, one okay. more question, please, sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, please ask. Uh, you're considering, uh, we are doing all these things for galaxies. You have chosen one galaxy. Means we are looking at some yeah. part of the galaxy in which we can have more than one galaxy. Because you are uh, looking for the lensing galaxy thing, can there be a possibility that uh, there can be more than one lensing galaxy in that part of the galaxy? Yeah, yeah. no. So, so of... actually, uh, even gra you know, galactic clusters, galaxy clusters, these are also very strong gravitational lenses. They actually behave as strong gravitational lenses. But this one is a single galaxy. This is a single galaxy. 
So we were just now considering a single galaxy lensing effect. But similarly, if you have a galaxy cluster and behind it, you are, I mean, you are getting a lens effect, it is the standard way of finding the dark matter in galaxy clusters. So if you have a cluster of galaxies, which is giving you a lensing effect, and you measure the mass coming because of the lens effect, and you compare that with the mass which you're getting because of the mass of stars you can see in those galaxies, you will see that there's a difference. And that's basically the dark matter. So in clusters of galaxies also, you have a very large amount of dark matter because another way of inferring dark matter for clusters of galaxies is if you calculate their masses and their velocities, you will realize that they will not bind together, right? But if you want to bind them together, you have to have a stronger mass which will bind it. And that mind, that mass is the dark matter. So the dark matter binds galaxies in galaxy clusters. Not the, the stellar mass is much lesser. If you just had the stellar masses, these galaxies would have gone away from each other. They would have not been bound, but they are bound because of the presence of the, the dark matter. Okay, so another question is about, sorry, one second, uh, about the assignment. So we've decided on 30th April. I think that's good enough, right? 15 days. Yeah. Okay, Urvashi. Yeah, tell me. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, earlier, I asked a question uh, related to that uh, black hole thing. Uh, sir explained that thing with the rigid object thing. Uh, because you are saying we have globular clusters. In our galaxy also, we have the globular cluster thing. And if we uh, go to that center part, can we have that gravitational lensing around that center part? And can we say over there this effect can happen over there and we can see this dark matter variation over there? around the center of the galaxy around the center of the galaxy so uh, around the actually what happens is uh, from the studies that people have made of dark matter we know that dark matter is more present in the outskirts of galaxies in the outer part of galaxies not in the central part so most of the dark matter even for our galaxy is outside it's in the halo the halo region of the galaxy is where the dark matter is sitting and not in the center in the center, you have a black hole sitting. So tomorrow, our last uh, tutorial will be actually on measuring the mass of the black hole. How can we measure the mass of the black hole, right? We'll be doing that. And again, that can be done using it. So, um, so the center of the galaxy does not have much of dark matter. It has a black hole sitting there. The halo is where the, the dark matter sits. And that is basically observed by seeing the motion of stars. So by seeing the motion of stars, we see what is the gravitational force which will cause it and do that like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Welcome, no problem. Any more questions? But tomorrow will be a fun thing where we'll do the black hole mass also. So I, I planned it in such a way that, you know, we started with exoplanets and end up with supermassive black holes. That's what we'll do tomorrow, right? So are there any more questions? If you if you still have questions tomorrow also we'll be meeting and the slack channel is anyway there for conversation so you can also post questions on the slack channel and uh, we'll meet tomorrow again at the same time right so um let's say bye bye and uh, i don't see any more questions so we'll say bye bye and tentatively the assignments have to be given on the 30th that is you'll get 15 days to go through the videos and do the stuff and uh, we'll meet tomorrow again. That will be our final meeting tomorrow at the same time for supermassive black holes. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we will calculate the mass of supermassive black holes for a galaxy. Okay, so see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Anything? Yeah. Mamta, I, I'll, I'll close it, right?